Welcome to another episode of the Being and Doing podcast, where I try to create a space and bring you stories of the unique minds that are all around us. And today I'm actually very excited about my guest because it is the first time I'm interviewing a very interesting Serbian musician uh, on a podcast in English. Uh, and I'm very curious to bring you uh, his personality because uh, I actually don't have really words to describe the breadth of his personality. So <laughs> he is broadly a composer, <laughs> but I'm sure he's much more than that. So I'm very curious to meet that rainbow today and uh, and welcome uh, Saleh. Can I call you Saleh? Or... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, after, after such an introduction, I'm like, wow, what am I supposed to say now? <laughs> but thank you, thank, thank you for such a lovely, lovely introduction and for inviting me to the podcast. This is actually my first podcast that I'm doing in... Uh, in English so it's it's also like very exciting for me too because it's been a while since I left LA and you don't have much opportunity to speak in English so looking forward to it so actually then it's a privilege for me to have this opportunity <laughs> so let's just say things happen in the right time finally yes, yes. <laughs> finally we meet i mean over over zoom for this for this occasion so then I will start with just a simple question. So what are some words that you describe yourself with? So it can be nouns, adjectives, whatever you feel like encapsulates who you are. Well, compassionate, I guess, empathic. That's that that's the first thing that really came to my mind actually, like you know, to care for, 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 for people around you know, to, and to really be empathic in, in, in every possible way. I cannot really think of anything else. I mean, is it stupid to say that you're good? Everyone thinks they're good. <laughs> so that's not really some sort of explanation. But yeah, I mean, I'm trying to be grateful. I'm trying to be kind. I'm, yeah, just to, you know, see the, to, to be able to see the people around you, to be to be able to be appreciative for nature around you and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, that, that, that pretty much describes it. I mean, the music and everything else, everything is a part of that system. I mean, music is the way I express that, all, all of that, things that you are, you express it, you express it through music. But uh, it's probably a tricky question because I'm, in my nature is that, that I really don't know how to talk about myself <laughs> too well. So... I don't, I don't really think about uh, about that so much. I mean, to try to specify, but I'm doing the best I can. If, <laughs> if you have any other suggestions, I may recognize myself in them, but it, nothing really comes to my mind. Well, uh, actually, then I have a question in terms of music and creation, uh, because in order to uh, be and achieve what you have done in, in your life, there there needs to be some sort of structure, some sort of um, some sort of discipline. And I'm so wondering how how do you combine that with compassion? Well, disciplined, I wish I was actually more disciplined. So the thing is I mm, I hope I <laughs> I, I don't know if there's an expression in English when you sit on two chairs, really. Oh, yeah. like, <laughs> when you're split. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I started as a guitar player and that's, I wanted that to be my future. Like, you know, to be like my dad, like to play the guitar and sing and have my own band and that's it. And then at one point when I was 13, I entered a band that is called Mama Coco. They were, they were actually my father's age. My father even played with them. So they were like a lot older. And, you know, they were the ones that actually, you know, when you're a kid, somebody has to like slap you from time to time just to keep you practicing and stuff like that. I mean, not, not literally, but they were the ones who actually gave me a lot of material to, to do. And, you know, I was all in that, in, in that direction. Like, you know, Stevie Wonder and like, uh, we play Stevie Wonder, we, we play Peter Gabriel. We, we, like a lots of stuff that, I, that you don't really hear mainstream. The, the the music I heard through my father, like Quincy Jones and all the other bands, like I was all in that direction. And and at one point I started to doing this formal education in, in like a classical music training. That's when I became a composer. I actually started loving classical music since I was 13. And actually that was, uh, no, not 13. 
that was the third year of high school. So that, that's like pretty late, mm-hmm. you know. But then from then on, I, I really had to do both kind of like each one of those disciplines requires some time. And I, I could never organize myself. Okay, now I'm going to do this. And tomorrow I'm going to do that. It was always like all around the place, depending on what's the priority in that moment. Mm-hmm. Like when I was in the third year of academy, I composed my first violin concerto. I was 23 at the time. And at that same period, we had a tour with Zdravko Cholic. He had those two concerts in the arena, Belgrade Arena. So I was like, thank God we have two concerts because I'm going to get some money so I can pay the stage manager to like get the chairs for the orchestra and stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, I, I, I was not disciplined, but I somehow, I'm trying to find the ways like to get it all done. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's more busy, sometimes not so much, but actually, I wish actually I was more disciplined. I'm trying, but, you know, when you try to do a lot of stuff at the same time, because, you know, you can, but you know, at the same time that you're not going to make, you know, and actually that kind of feeling that you're being chased and that you're constantly late, maybe actually that has some, some good things about them. Like you never, you don't tap yourself on the shoulder too much because you just have to keep going in order to make it to the next thing that you're supposed to do. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but at the same time, I mean, in, instead of just saying a few words that this, that would describe me, maybe <laughs> this kind of little bit longer explanation would do it better. Mm-hmm. Well, to be honest, I, I I kind of experienced similar things in my own life. Uh, and then I started, after starting doing my therapy, I realized, well, it's okay to embrace many different parts of ourselves. And it's okay to sometimes express one and sometimes express the other. And I think that's actually, it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting because we can live many lives in one life a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, if you look at it like that, it actually, it kind of is. I mean, you know, it's one thing when, when, uh, when I'm supposed to conduct a concert cl- uh, composing something classical. And it's the other thing when I'm getting on a stage with a band, it's a totally different audience. It's a different culture of listening to to the music and it's a it is actually a a different kind of kind of life in in music and it's really interesting because i on one end there's the classical stuff on the other hand there's a rock and roll stuff and in the middle there's theater on the terrazie that's actually the place where i work as a a conductor and orchestrator we the 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 most recent musical we did was flash dance i did the orchestration for that it's it's more like a making it into a five-piece band. I mean, we didn't need strings and winds and everything. But there's an interesting musical from uh, Bayaga, actually. It's called Zdruge Strane Jastuka, on the other side of the pillow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they made a musical. It's like what they did with ABBA, and these guys tried to, to do it with Bayaga, which is a Serbian pop star, like one of the, you know, like like Leonard Cohen. I, I don't know who to compare him with, I mean, but it's, it's not Leonard Cohen. Balazic would be more like Cohen. But uh, yeah, and uh, that theater is somewhere in the middle, actually, because you have a rhythm section that comes from pretty much rock and roll, and you have like a brass section. Like it's not like big band; you don't have five trumpets, four trombones, but you have two trumpets, two trombones. So you have like this big band plus strings plus rock and roll kind of sound. And that's the third life, like you know, as a conductor in a theater. So so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really grateful. I mean, it's a stressful thing when you're supposed to like do things on deadline and especially now I'm doing this this doc, doctorate thing and it's it's gonna take a lot of a lot, lot from me but it has to be like that it's a huge topic but at the same time it's uh it's very interesting like when you look at it like that like I had a promotion of my album recently with the band and these musicals and now it's time for a little bit more classic but this is gonna be my final exam like once I do that <laughs> oh my god I'm gonna take some nice vacation but yeah it's it's i'm i'm really grateful like because uh, because i found myself pretty early in music and uh, i'm really grateful for everything that's happening and i'm trying to like handle it all you know i might become more disciplined one day who knows <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, um, just I have many questions, but before we go into into the kind of fine uh, lyrical questions, just to systematize, what what are you in music? Because you were mentioning <laughs> being a <laughs> classical composer, having your own band, yeah. 
uh, being you are a professor as well. Um, yes. And uh, what else? Maybe maybe it's better for you to say because <laughs> I might miss. Yeah. Some. Okay. Well, let, let, let's start with the official <laughs> stuff. I'm a professor. Like my, uh, I'm currently working at a faculty in Niche, and uh, I teach vocal literature, the uh, orchestration, like an introduction to orchestration. Uh, analysis of musical styles, composition, but it's composition is kind of facultative. It's a, like a really this first level before they even try to like get to, to to the real academy in Belgrade, for example, or anywhere else where you really have to study composition. Then uh, the second job that is not uh, steady, actually, they they it's it's like a six month contract, so I'm not. Fully employed in position in theater on Terrazia, but I work there as a conductor, so professor, conductor. But uh, a lot of my time goes goes on arranging. This is like I started with official stuff, and I, I have you you said systematize. <laughs> How can I systematize? Yeah, uh, I'm a I'm a composer and a conductor. Like that pretty much sums it all. I started as a guitar player, and guitar is still my number one instrument. I'm also like a multi-instrumentalist, it's a complicated word, but I do play like... Which other instruments? Or, uh, uh, guitar, bass, piano, and drums. And bass, double bass as well, piano and everything with the keys and drums. I have a, I have an old Slingerland and I, and I love drums actually. I started pretty much drums as, at the same time when I started the guitar. It's just that I didn't really, I didn't have the drums and I didn't put, put that much work in, but I can record for myself and I can record for other people when you, when you, when we're talking about this, like pop production mm -hmm. and also for my own band, actually, I just had my album released and on some of those songs, I pretty much played everything and it's, it's good. It's fast sometimes when you don't need to depend on other people. So it's, it has its, its practical sides, but then again, you know, playing with others is also, you get that magic that you can only get by playing at the same time with other people. So that's also valuable. And I'm planning to do that a little bit more. I, yeah, because all these guys that I'll play playing in the band, they're really good. Hmm. I must notice yeah. something while you're talking about this, there's like a huge smile on your, on your face. And it's like, I feel like you, while you're talking about every of these aspects, it's like you are being in them in the moment and then something happens for you, something that's magical inside of you. And I'm wondering what that is. No, I'm just thinking about these guys as I'm, as I'm, uh, as I, as I'm telling you about uh, these guys are playing, playing a band. because like, we haven't, done that sort of like jam together and create together so i'm just wondering maybe i should i should call them so when i just i just started to imagine that scene and i was like man that would be good and it would be faster because like when you're doing it all by yourself usually it starts off with an idea with the drums and then i come come into the bass and everything but you have to you know, like you have to stop one to do the other yeah. thing and then come back and so on and when you have people around you you can you can organize it much more much more fast and actually that's the thing that i like and that's what made me maybe become a conductor later just care uh, care about care for the details in music like to care uh, about the details in articulation in dynamics and like all those little things that you know so, so sometimes people don't, don't think about it's more like a classical approach to to you know popular music and that's like the meeting of those two worlds like the way you try to articulate as a conductor some classical stuff you can also do that with rock and roll instruments you know play softer open up your high head, like some sort of instructions that are really concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> no, I, I'm oh, actually... how, did I, how did I get there? <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying to, to see the, your thought process. And actually I'm constantly drawn by the, the, by the painting behind you. And I'm wondering what it is oh. because I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Marley. It was a, it was a painting in my wife's apartment. And uh, I don't know why that you wanted to get rid of him, but so I adopted Bob Marley, and there he is. <laughs> there are some other paintings as well of my father and my mother. So I'm, I'm actually, I have to rethink because there's not a lot of space in here, and uh, mm. yeah, actually, I wish I had more space to put a lot of those paintings around. Actually, I'm, 
I, on Facebook, there are some interesting like groups where you have like old photos of old musicians, like from jazz, from classical. So I'm actually collecting all those photos, and at one point I'm just imagining to have like this. It doesn't have to be a large room, but it can make like um, what's the word for for the thing that you you collage? Like yeah, like a collage that you can put on a wall, really, like to cover the the the, the whole part of the wall. It would be interesting. <laughs> I, you know, from time to time, I just go check, and there's like you know 200 of some really cool photos of some really good musicians, not necessarily musicians, some other people too, but. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I had the questions that I stayed with uh, when you were talking about your different expressions and different aspects and playing with Zdravko Cholic. And maybe we want to say who Zdravko Cholic is because people who are going to be listening to this might not yes, know yes, the yes, extent yes, yeah. of this person. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing is that parallel, while I was going to the high school and later on the academy, I, I played in a lot of bands, a lot of rock bands. And then at some point from 2003, I started accompanying some people that were like, like mainstream stars, like, you know, Sandra Radovich, so some, you know, singers that came up at that time. And uh, soon after that, I started playing with Rav Kocholic, who is like Tom Jones in America. Like he's a really ex-Yugoslavian. I think he's pretty much the only one that actually is still alive and that still does does the concerts and everything. So he's like really big in all of ex-Yugoslavian republics. Like, you know, I, I remember my first concert with him was in Slovenia and it was like full and it was really cool. And then we played a lot of, uh, like all throughout the Europe, pretty much. We played in London as well. What was the, oh my God, I forgot the name the name of the place but we played in london as well i i, I was in london for like three days so it, it doesn't really count and it's like <laughs> it was like 15 years ago I, I would love to come again sometimes but we played also we played australia we played canada we went to america like it's it's a life experience for me because like with nobody else i could travel <laughs> you know that to those destinations and I'm wondering also, like, what is it the feeling when you are in front in front of so much people? I, I don't think I know anyone who has been in front of so much people. <laughs> well, at one point, at least for me, it, it became. It, 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 it's almost uh, every time it's pretty much the same, like when we're playing stadiums. I think you. Somehow, at least for me, I mean, I stopped noticing how, what is the number? You just see like a crowd. It's like you're like on a beach and you're seeing the water like going up and down. It's, mm. you don't see it as a group of people anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I got used to it really. Of course, there is some adrenaline, but I cannot really tell the difference if there's more adrenaline when I'm, coming up the Colaris to conduct something or here in front of like we played Maracana that was the most that was like 60,000 people on Maracana in 2007 just to say to people this is a football stadium in Belgrade football stadium yeah that that can fit 60,000 people yeah so yeah that was the the, the biggest crowd that I played mm -hmm. with Ravko and yeah it was it was pretty amazing and that's the first time we used in-ear monitoring which we never did before so it was like it was a weird, weird feeling. You're, like you were there, but you cannot feel that whole thing because you have your your earplugs where you have instruments, and you hear a bit of the audience, but they're somehow in some vacuum space. So that was a bit weird. Mm -hmm. But other than that, yeah, it's mm -hmm. I guess maybe overwhelming. But as I said, we probably got used to it <laughs> over time, so I stopped paying attention. But yeah, well, because we mentioned Zdravko Cholic before that, at the same time when he had those two big concerts in Belgrade, in Belgrade Arena, at that same, same time I was organizing my own first violin concerto in uh, in City Hall. Actually, So I, I was lucky enough to have a friend that actually wanted to finance that concert because that, that's always the biggest problem. Like, how, how are we going to pay like 50 people? Because that's, what, that's how much people you need for a symphony orchestra. And... Uh, this friend of mine, he helped me. He actually financed the whole thing and he 
put me in contact with the mayor at the time, and sh she was kind enough to, to actually give me up to allow me to use that space for the concert. So it was really magical, and it was mm. it was full. But you know, at the same time, you know, I'm in the same day. I'm, I have to be at the rehearsal with Rafa Cholich, and later on, like I have to like meet wow. the second horn to give him the scores, and you know, to rehearse the orchestra and to. And because I didn't conduct only my concerto, which which is a stress by itself. Like that was the first time I stood in front of the orchestra to conduct, you know, the full concert by myself. And uh, I was conducting myself. I conducted Sibelius' violin concerto and uh, some Honegger summer master. I, never mind, but I mean, it's a it's a huge program. So, and yeah, I cannot remember being disciplined then, but I do remember that that it really was a lot of lot of work especially when I was composing and, and touring at the same time. Wow, I can't imagine. So, but then there must be something about, I, I remember organizing one small concert and, and you know that feeling when you do it at the end and oh, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I have done it. It's nice, no? Oh my God, I remember like the day after I, I was supposed to meet the people to give them the money for the, for the concert. And it was, um, it was called Stupitsa. It was pretty much, uh, it's... Um, Yugoslavsko Narodno Podvište Yugoslavian uh, Theater on, on the other side there was a musical academy and uh, that 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 place too pizza where we used to meet it, it's also a theater but anyway I remember I was sick the whole day and when I when I met the last person to, to give him the money I just <laughs> started walking and I, I had to go outside and throw up I mean that's how that's Ooh. how affected I was like oh my god it's over it's really over Jesus I, I remember having those things like a few times. One first time was when I was uh, entering uh, on my entrance exam for, for a musical high school, Josip Slavansky, because I didn't have any primary music, music education as people do in Serbia. In Serbia, you have you go like six years if you play piano, four years if you play some other instrument, and then you can go to music high school, and from music high school, you can apply to the academy. Anyway, I didn't have that first step, so... I remember that I on first entrance exam I, I felt they wouldn't let me in and they told me to get back in August. So I took some private lessons and I improved and from then on everything went well. But I remember that day when I actually went home. I you know I just I just lay down and fell asleep and woke up the next day and some it was really weird. Mm. But yeah, there were there were there were a few moments that that when you when you say like when you do it. It, the feeling is great, but sometimes it can it can it can do like a little bit of physical mess. Like yes, you know. yeah, of course. If you do it under a lot of stress, then it's it is crazy. Yeah, but over time, when you get used to it, then you just you just yeah. keep going, and you know it's just, it yeah. always came like that. I mean, when I was in the United States as well. I mean, we'll get to that. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to ask before before that. Also, you were mentioning different feelings with different audiences. Uh, and uh, the the culture of listening to music being very different. So I'm I'm wondering, can you say more about that? What how does it feel? How does it look like? Well, the audience that comes to Kolaras to, to any concert hall to listen to classical music. Like you know, they're gonna there's like a code of manners in in those situations. I guess maybe there's a better word for that. Code of but color. anyway, I mean you. Yes, you sit down, you listen to it, whatever it is, you're going to clap. You're, at, you're not going to give your honest reaction sometimes. You're just going to clap, right? And in that sense, these other audience, like whether you're playing in a restaurant or you're playing with a rock band, okay, well, the restaurants and a rock band, they're also like two different things, but the, 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 the contact between the, 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 the listener and the music is not as formal, and mm -hmm. the audience is much more critical, actually. Yeah, critical and at, at, at the same time responsive. Like when you really get them, you're going to see their reaction. When you're not getting to them, they're going to throw bottles at you. Maybe not today, but, you know, I'm yeah. exaggerating to make a point. So, yeah, and uh, that's why I think like for, at least I think that that was very valuable for me, like to have that perspective, like that perspective from that kind of audience and that kind of connecting people through music. To have that as an ability when you are composing some classical stuff, to have that in mind, like not to, you know, make something that they're going to bite more easily, but it's it's the, the honest way people react to music and you're going to see it 
much more likely in that kind of place than in a concert hall, wherever it was going to be politically correct and, and, and so on. And it's who are the honestly. who are the first people that are listening to your composers compositions? I guess the audience. I mean, because I usually don't play it to anyone before it on the on the concerts because you don't you, there, there's nothing to play. I mean, I can play them Sibelius MIDI file, which can give you some idea of the structure, but it's not the real thing. But I, I don't have like certain people that I play my stuff to. Like mm -hmm. my composition professor was like which he's he passed away a few years ago. I used to play my stuff for him because you know he was a you know professor and but sometimes even to him it 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 happened that you know simply he's living his life I'm living my own and I didn't make a single consultation I just bring in the score and the and the DVD like with never get a doula playing some of my stuff I, and you know I'm trying to explain myself how I you know I was in the process so I didn't want to I didn't want to take his time mm -hmm. but other than that it's we usually for example when I did my first symphony uh, my best man, violin player Milos Petrovic, also my one of my best friends, he played this violin concerto with me when we were both 23 years old. And he was also a concert master when we did my first symphony in Kovar. He was here, he was uh, sleeping actually in my place, well, he, because he lives in, and works in Germany now. So he was a bit in the process. I played some parts to him, and but you know, it's, it's just because he was here and you know, he was a concert master, so actually, asking some questions about the bowling like you know since you're here and you're gonna play it let's try a few versions of this and see what works more so sometimes that happens when friends are around when i'm working when they ask me to play, play me what you're doing i just play it and that's it but yeah i usually i usually keep it to myself before it's you know almost done <laughs> so it's a little bit of a lonely process then yeah, yeah, it's absolutely a lonely process, especially for a classical composition. Like when you're making a song, when you're recording a pop song or whatever, I can do it by myself. But, you know, sometimes I play somebody to play saxophone, somebody to play strings and stuff like that. I mean, that's how I pretty much recorded the whole first album of mine. And uh, yeah, that's sometimes you invite other people to play and that it, it makes the whole process more fun and you have some other energy in, in that whole thing. But when you're composing, it's it's really just you and uh, there is no other way. Like it has to be, it has to be like that. And you're the one actually making all the decisions. And But I, I love it. It's just uh, sometimes it, it's, it's, it's pretty much like everything. Like sometimes you have good ba good days when you can compose a lot and sometimes you have bad days and everything you do. You hear it tomorrow and you realize that it sucks. And, Cannot use pretty much. You can use these two bars, but everything else just 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 delete it. Yeah. So yeah, but then again, you get used to it, and it, it it's that kind of discipline in composing. That's the type of discipline that I use on on the on the other types of music that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. my, my my album, if even if it's a like a rock uh, funk, it has a lot of stuff in it, but it it fits in that popular genre, let's say. I'm pretty much focused on the details in, in the same way that I'm focused on details when I'm writing something. Mm -hmm. I, I, I try to like really keep it <laughs> as clean as possible. Mm. And I'm wondering, uh, when does the creation start? Does it start in the studio? Does it start in your head and then it happens in the studio or it's a mix or? Mm. I, I think for every song is different and for every project was different. Okay. Maybe when I have a commission, then I simply start to like dig and at some point it, it comes. But a lot of my ideas actually came from from uh, me just playing around with the guitar and then I play something and, you know, I grab that idea and then I keep on going. And that's pretty much the way you, the way the composition is is, is done. Mm -hmm. sometimes you can hear a part of music that is already there and you just have to write it down that happened as well a few times where i really just wrote it down and i did some 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 things in orchestration and that was it but sometimes you really have to just play and when you when you find a good idea try to develop that and you know it's a system of action and reaction really i mean that's the process of composing mm -hmm. pretty much 
And then I wanted to ask you, actually, what was your first touch with music? How did that start? Uh, when I was in a visit to my father in 1992, I was it, it was a summer, so I, I I was still nine. I'm born in September, so in, in September that fall I will turn ten. I went to see him, and it was in a German part of Switzerland. The place was called Hindelbank. It's like a small village close to Bern. And uh, I really had nothing to do, and I was there for a few months. I didn't know the language. There there was no any friends, anything. So pretty much the only thing I could do is to start playing something. And there was this red Fender Stratocaster that was hanging on the wall, and I liked it. And my father had a story that that's like that's the guitar, the guitar that he bought for me. So what was it really for me? Never mind. But you know, it serves a purpose. And that's how I really started playing. And um, since I didn't have nothing else to do when I was in Switzerland, I really did it every day for like a few months. And. Mm-hmm. It, it it was a struggle, like, you know, the, the House of the Rising Sun, like, you know, those four chords just strumming in tempo. Oh, my God, that was <laughs> frustratingly hard for me to, you know, learn. But but I did learn it, and that, that's really how it all started. And then I came back to Belgrade. Guitar was still in Switzerland. But our mutual friend, uh, also the guitar player, famous guitar player from Serbia, Zlatko Manojlovic, mm-hmm. he, actually, he actually brought me that, that first... Uh, Stratocaster, that was my guitar for, yeah, pretty much until 1996. Because uh, that was like a hard time in Belgrade, in a way. So the guy actually attacked me in my own building where I lived. We were getting going back home from the gig. It's like a public transportation. And... The place where I live is just you get outside the bus and you have like maybe 20 meters and you're in the building already. But, you know, the guy waited for me there and he entered the building after me and he pulled out a gun and uh, took my guitar in on the first floor. We live in the third floor. Whoa. And he took that. That was the, the guitar, that, that red Stratocaster that I started uh, playing on. Whoa. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a hell of a guitar. But never mind. I mean, I get the other guitar luckily my father is a guitar player so in order to comfort me he sent me because he lives in switzerland and you know we were living in belgrade we still are so yeah i got a new guitar but that was a interesting experience yeah yeah wow you get over it over time but you know i still sometimes dream about that guitar i mean it's a you know it's a 80 stratocaster it's nothing too fancy but it's really a wonderful wonderful instrument and anyway that was the first contact with the with music like through the guitar because my father was a guitar player. And as I said, pretty much since I was born, he used to live in Switzerland. I used to live in Serbia. And he comes from time to time and I miss him. And there's this whole connection between us that didn't really happen. Then, you know, I wanted to make it happen through music in a, in a, in a weird kind of way. Mm-hmm. So I started playing and that was like the model to make, the, to make, to make my daddy proud and <laughs> stuff like that. And, and, and I just, you know, got hooked on, on, on music. And he used to listen to good stuff. You know, I remember my favorite band in the, when I was in the primary school, like, you know, fifth and sixth grade were Creedence Clearwater Revival, like, you know, Suzy Q and that kind of stuff. Jimi Hendrix, Earthman and Fire, Quincy Jones, all the all, all stuff from Quincy Jones, like, you know, mm. when he got back from Paris. So some really, really, really good stuff. And I just kept really doing it. Not not thinking about nobody actually made me do it. Nobody cared if I'm doing it or not. I just found it, found something that I can really put my all all time in. And the more I do, the more the more happy I was. Because, yeah. You know, the time was kind of weird. I mean, you know, the the groups in in school where you can actually hang out if you're not doing that. So I think that pretty much you know <laughs> that whole musical thing might actually save me because the, 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 those times in Serbia was were not. Not that great. I mean, just again to say to people who are not from Serbia, that was that was warm t- war times and a lot of inflation, and then eventually bombing. So it was it was difficult to stay sane and difficult not to get into drugs. I think <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we were too small for drugs at that time. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Actually, when you say drugs, I remember. A lot of those guys actually overdosed themselves from, from, from heroin. That's like, 
that that was the serious stuff at that time yeah yeah and yeah. Then, basically that was the the entrance the guitar was the entrance and then you said you did music academy so what happened next what's the journey like the journey so yeah i started with the guitar and then then i fell in love with chopin oh i love chopin <laughs> yeah well that, that that's what got me in the classical music really because as i said i, I went to high school just to learn theory because these these friends of my father that i that, that i was in a the band they were like you have to learn music theory that's very important i was like okay i learned it and and that's it so i had no plans of becoming a composer or you know classical music was boring i didn't listen to it at all there were a few things that i loved since i was a kid my mother used to play them to me like one was of course mozart uh, uh Nacht Musik. i love that since uh, since i was a kid that then tchaikovsky swan lake and uh oh yeah Mozart G minor, G minor symphony that to, to this day that's like you know it's popular everyone knows it but still i mean that composition is insanely good but other than that as i said i mean i hated classical music classical music before i was 17. that's when i discovered chopin and i started practicing piano like crazy and what about chopin i mean i i think for me personally chopin is is kind of an expression of longing and and it's just like every time he has this deceptive cadence i'm like ah oh. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm wondering what is it that it works for you uh, actually that was a cd that i borrowed from a friend and uh, it's one of those cds that you can buy in a, you know on a soup in, in a supermarket like the best of chopin something like that mm -hmm. But uh, it was played by Maurizio Polini, who I became to love, like when, when I heard uh, the other recordings that he had made. So uh, th there were some etudes, there were some mazurkas, there were some waltzes. And I remember that the first thing was this, this uh, C sharp minor waltz. Mm -hmm. no, never mind. I mean, I think my sister used to play it. And then when I heard it again, it. it I fell in love with that composition in particular, and I didn't know how to play the piano well, but I had to learn that stuff. And and there has this um, this other uh, <laughs> you know that part. Yeah. So I, you know, I just had to learn how to play that. And that's what actually we began my classical music journey. And since then, really, I'm still trying to somehow keep up with, maybe not now, but especially in that first period, because I didn't have any knowledge of it before that. There was simply a lot to keep up with and to really hear a lot of music. And I remember going to my first consultation before I got on, on composition on Belgrade Music Academy. And... Uh, Professor asked me, like, which uh, composer from 20th century is my favorite? And I said, Tchaikovsky. <laughs> That's how clueless I was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there was, there was a lot of keeping up. But at the same time, it really opened me up in terms of knowing the, the structure of music, knowing the harmony, knowing how to lead voices, like knowing that, what, what would be the word for Zanat? Like, you know, the craft yeah, of composition. Craft. Really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, then then it shapes everything else. Like, because if you're aware of it, you know, it, you can play a song. If you're aware of the form while you're playing it, if you know what are the climaxes, you know, if you know the, the, the articulations, the dynamics, it's you can make so much more when you just know all that stuff that you learn in learning composition and seeing how other, other people did it. It's, just a wonderful never-ending process and mm. then the guitar then i mean guitar is still my most honest and most direct direct way of communicating through music but it's still just one tool that has to be a part of this whole picture and that whole picture is always much more important than your ability to play of course i mean that too but there has to be both things and mm. that's why i think that every every player whatever you play sh it should at least try to compose something like you have to, to try to have that 
perspective as well, especially, you know, people who are good at it. You have a lot of literature that came through your fingers and your mind already. Like, why not try to combine it and come up with something of your own? Because that's the whole, that's the whole point of everything. And that's how we actually do it. So they actually have an advantage in a way only if they, they, they wanted to do it. So yeah, if I could encourage somebody to do it, so, you know, try to compose. <laughs> Yeah. So actually, it was so nice to hear you play because I feel like talking to you is almost elusive without listening to your music. So I think at the end of the interview, I would love to hear something from from you for our audience. But oh, uh, you, you mean like like this on the piano? Yeah, I mean, or wh- whatever you can. I mean, whatever it's feasible to do, because I'm yeah. thinking that uh, that. You can say so much more through the music than <laughs> than through actually explaining the music. <laughs> yeah, um, but I know, but maybe maybe it's better to play some of those recordings. Hmm. Oh, well, yeah, well, 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 we can we can we can yeah. think of that. So I, I'm thinking also. Um, so now, like uh, in terms of the impacts on your life you you mentioned your dad and him being a guitar player and you mentioned some of the musicians you love but who are the people that have really shaped you and impacted you the most in your journey well the first one is of course my mother because you know she was a professor of english literature she she also used to teach in Niche at some point in her, in her career. So she, she used to take me to Niche. Niche is a city that is south of Serbia, like a south from Belgrade, like 300 kilometers. And uh, then she started working in Faculty of Dramatic Arts. She taught English, but through that English, she actually taught them how to think in, uh, in 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 this way that is connected to their profession, like it's uh, what are the modern dramas, and she had like a very 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 specific way of of teaching her students. But yeah, she, all of my character, Sabina, my, my English is bugging. Like uh, my traits. Well, yeah, everything that makes me what I am actually comes directly from my mother. That's mm-hmm. the, that's the point. Mm-hmm. Like all that idea of compassion, of you know, being aware of other people, you know, be grateful, and you know, all, all of my views come pretty much from her and from my uh, composition professor Vlastimir Trajković. He he was a professor at uh, Belgrade Academy of Music, and I studied with him for, for five years. That's that's like the old program before Bologna came in. Composition studies were five years, so. Uh, we were five years in contact and actually through teaching me music he taught me a lot of stuff about you know about manners in general like he was really he was member of uh academy of arts and science yeah yeah so he was like a real intellectual and he knew some, sometimes he overreacted but i mean I think that is good because all the students that were in his class picked up a little from that and you know it's good to have that as some sort sort of a role model, and and he showed us a lot of great music, and as I said, both through music and through really educating me about various kinds of stuff. Yeah, the two of them, so my mother and my composition professor. Father was not not here directly, but you know that that first connection to music is because of my father, so he's also involved in you know that may be the crucial thing actually, even though he was not physically present but yeah mm. Liliana and Liliana Bogueva my mother and Vlastimir Trakovic my composition professor two of them are the most important and then how has being a father changed you or affected you yes 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 I mean I'll, the, the, this is all actually before before uh, Ljubica my wife and my daughter Leona it's it's wonderful. It's very wonderful. I'm, I'm trying to put it into words because I didn't really think about it what, because it's happening now all the time. And yeah, it's, it just reminds you of how life is wonderful in a way and, and simple. And, you know, she, she actually calms me down, like, you know, when I'm nervous about something. But that's, you know, 
it's just that like don't be nervous so it's you know she, she, she's like a little medicine <laughs> yeah literally, literally well in 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 terms of creativity in terms of do i do anything differently just because leona is around i don't know i don't know but i did i did make her a song it's actually on the album and i actually made a song leona before she was born so i can you know make my wife to choose that that name for her <laughs> so yeah there, there, there's a song for, for for leona and in the second movement of my saxophone concerto there's this the very beginning i remember when i was composing i was at the piano she was still a baby she just learned how to walk and so she came to the piano and she did down boom boom down to to boom not in that rhythm but those were the notes so i took that theme and like that's the beginning of the whole second movement and the whole first section is actually that and it's, it's kind of funny the way it's done i mean you you, you have to listen to it so no, but it, I'm um, curious, yeah. that's a I mean, it's it's hard to to, to, to try to explain it. It's, it's better. If, I think it's maybe we here, can but... play that at the beginning of the interview when I when I edit it, so we can do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a slow music. It doesn't, you know, you can talk over it, especially you 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 here. But yeah, so she she definitely. I don't know. I mean, she 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 she's seven now, so she she's a part of a system for a long time now. But yeah, she, she's definitely a very, very, very important part of the system. I'm, I'm really glad she's here. She's mm. it's just a whole new category when you have some some little thing to, you know, to take care of. Yeah, and I'm wondering the name Leona, why was that so appealing to you? I was on a tour, it was like a slow, uh, small tour with Ben Svinapod. And uh, their driver had a daughter whose name was Leona. And I haven't heard the name before that. I was thinking Luna or something, but I didn't really like either one of those. And I heard Saleh, which is their driver, talking on Skype with his daughter. And that's when I first heard the name Leona. And then I was like, Leona said, oh my God, that would be so nice. And, you know, since then I, you know, stuck to the idea and made a song. And <laughs> mm. But it's good. It fits, it fits her. I, I really love that we chose that name for her. Mm. A good fit. Yes. I, I don't know. I, I have seen one interview and I do see her as a little lioness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm curious, uh, what is maybe a, a pain that has shaped you the most um, that you are willing to share? So rather than, you know, a success. Pain. Hmm. Well, you know, there's a there's a pain part about my father. There's a pain part about those little things that happen in the meantime, like when they when they took their guitar, that was also one traumatic thing. Then when I got to high school, before, like when I didn't go through in that first entrance exam. Like, uh, those are just some little pains that I'm trying to think of, but they all actually turned out good. Mm -hmm. Because, like, every pain makes you work harder, and, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't work for some people, and th th that's why, you know, with I guess each person has its own path. But uh, I think pains are generally important in that sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, hopefully that they're, you know, bearable and that all those problems are solvable. Mm -hmm. But I cannot really think of of of, of one that that actually changed, mm -hmm. because m the music was somehow always there. Like whatever happens, whether it's good or bad, it's like a little shelter. So, mm -hmm. and it's immune. It's immune pretty much to, I mean, immune. It comes out through music, but yeah, it doesn't make me do things differently or even thinking to switch to something else or something like that. Mm. One of the recent pains, which was which which left a, a mark, I guess, is the passing of my mother. Like that's the whole new category of pain. When you lose someone that close, and uh, that simply like when that happens, it's it's really a new new category of pain. not just pain. I mean, experience. Then you actually try to remember, not not try to remember, but you realize that actually all the things that they are left. Are still somehow inside, and they're, they're still actually here, even though they're, you know, 
you cannot hug them, you cannot talk to them, but if they passed on what needs to be passed on, then it's, it's all good, I guess, but it is a new category. Yeah, I actually had an experience. Uh, I went to Madrid and I went, they have something they call micro theaters. And there was um, two actors with five of us sitting in a very intimate space. And it was about uh, a woman and her grandma. Um, and it was kind of a memory and it was coming to the present moment and the memory, present moment memory. And she said, basically at the end, yes, you live through me and I just remembered because my grandma was my grandpa was singing me songs and when he passed away every time I sing the songs he was singing to me it feels like he's still somewhat there <laughs> yeah yeah exactly wonderful story yeah yeah uh, and then uh, one other thing is uh, what was the truth about reality that you were um, unwilling to accept for the longest time so what were you resisting in terms of truths that are truths of life that you were like, no, 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 I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to look at that. Hmm. I really cannot remember. That's amazing. <laughs> no, because I mean, yeah like one one thing that i that i resisted like when am i going to do the first training and get these extra 20 kilos off like that's the resistance that is <laughs> there in the, like these past few months i guess but you know i'll beat that but uh yeah truth a lot that i didn't that i didn't want to face i really cannot think of anything mm. maybe maybe you can give me an example maybe i maybe i'm missing something but I'm thinking, what was it for myself? Now, no one have actually asked me to give an example. <laughs> I think, uh, well, one, one person actually answered that uh, for her, it was that life is not black and white and that uh, life happens in the grave, for example. And for her, it took some time to actually realize how to hold that gray space of reality, for example. But uh, if nothing comes to your mind, we can go to the next question. And if something comes back, we can we can come back. To yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, definitely not. I mean, because, you know, I, I luckily had, I guess, enough life experience in, in a way. Like I remember I was my mother was not like a strict mother. So I was really free since mm -hmm. I was like sixth or fifth grade to go to Kai instead. That's like a place where, you know, Hard rock plays. It's 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 like a. It's a part of the, the college. Oops, the technique. It's a club of students of technique. So it's like a student yeah. space. It's a student club. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Kids don't don't go to student clubs, but I was free to go because nobody told me not to. So. Yeah. So yeah, since then I was really exposed to a lot of different stories, a lot of different kinds of people. So I guess. Yeah. I guess by experience it comes you come to a certain point that nothing can surprise you and that you can really understand that it, you know, that there can be a lot of different points of view and mm. I don't remember actually when did I got get that but I hmm. and I'm uh, I'm curious um what uh, what does success look like for you and when was the first time actually you were kind of faced with the concept of success <sighs> I remember this little detail that, that that was a success at that point, and that was, I mean, since I remember it, it has to be the, the important one. When we had our first gig when I was twelve, like, and <laughs> when I played a few long solos, and you know, people like that. That was the first encouragement I get. I got from somebody that I don't know that that the thing you're doing is is good. So I remember that as my first big success. Mm. But in general, what I think of success now is just, you know, being able to be enough healthy in body and mind to do what you want to do. I mean, just to be able to compose and, okay, I got to, to, to a certain point where I can, you know, choose the projects that I want to do. And I guess... The idea of success is that 
Hmm. Interesting question. I just feel lucky. I feel lucky that I have the opportunity to do what I do and to try to express myself through that. And that's success for me. It doesn't have to be numbers. It doesn't have to be YouTube views. I'm not really good at marketing myself. I should learn how to do it a bit more. I mean, I should create a website because like, I'm 40 years old and I did a lot of stuff and I still don't have a website. When people ask me for my biography, I'm going, oh, no, do I have one? And because, you know, I have to, to, to do that thing. But really that whole official idea of success is, is I don't think is the most important one. I mean, it's, it's, it's when you reach a certain level of doing something i guess you should hire someone to do your like marketing thing or to just become better at handling your Insta instagrams and stuff so you can like invite more people to what you're trying to do i still don't know how to do that but in, you know my i think that the success is just to be able to do what you what you like to do and if if, if that's also your job like that's that's it i mean yeah and it, because you never really know what's gonna what's gonna make you successful you know a lot of things that even you sometimes artists don't like the, the, the stuff that they made that that, that, that made them successful right that, that there are a lot of combinations so i think that every only thing that you can do is to try to work the best you can to like really do this thing that you're doing whether you're writing whether you're composing just to try to do it the best you can and mm -hmm. everything else is really not up to you so I mean, now that you're talking about, I actually really enjoy hearing that because uh, I feel like, you know, if you would actually make a web page or, or, or market yourself, it would also narrow down who you are. And at the moment, you are so many things and you don't really need to fit into any category. So I feel that's quite an advantage to have <laughs> and still be able to do and still be able to perform and compose and still have people coming to your, so your marketing is actually the good, the good stuff you make, <laughs> which is the perfect marketing in a way. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's the way it should be. I mean, you should promote yourself when there is something to promote and this whole idea of being a star sometimes is something else, something that's not really, it's weird. And I, I still, you know, I actually am good in keeping it on this side when, you know, in, in, in the side of the quality, actually, the stuff has to be good. It's not about being popular. It's about, it's about making something good rather than something that's necessarily going to be popular. If you can make, make it, you know, both, that's, that's great. But again, I have to say to, to, to mention like Zdravko Cholic, like one of the great things that I actually saw during my uh, my time with the band is that, you know, I was not the one who actually had that success, but I was actually the first next to this guy and I actually saw all the reactions with the people. And, you know, you're not experiencing it, but you're, you are near the person that is, that is experiencing it. So it gives you like the first. Mm. the first impression of what what it would actually be like if you were that popular and i'm not sure if i like it too much it has like you know some cute moments but i think it kind of takes you away from, from from what you're trying to do and actually i think that maybe maybe that, that, that could just be a theory like maybe if if you don't have enough official recognition that's actually going to keep you going more than if you had it mm -hmm. i'm not sure if i uh, if i said it well but when you're constantly striving for it and despite all that official things which are actually meaningless you still keep on pushing and you actually never get too too many taps on the shoulder to think that you're good you're ne you never think that you're good enough and that's what actually keeps you going mm -hmm. so that's also I think that, that 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 can be a good thing. Of course, you have you gotta have some some points where you actually do something that you can be, you know, proud of and have this this feeling that you actually accomplished something, and then you can go on to the next one. But mm. it's it, it's the most important to stay focused without any outside reaction, whether it's good or bad. I mean, because if you dedicate enough time, if you dedicate your life to something, you have to learn at some point to trust yourself. Maybe not only, but mostly. You can hear all the opinions from outside and stuff, but you are the one making that decision. And mm. as long as there's, as long as the, the there are no influences, too much influences around, the better, I think. 
Oh yeah, I really I quite like this that the learning of trusting yourself mostly. <laughs> I <laughs> think it's I think it's a lifelong process, but it's a beautiful yeah, it's a beautiful thing to strive for. Um, and then um, I am wondering, uh, you are talking a lot about music, uh, but what else supports you? uh in in your journey is music really the central only thing that happens or there are some other things that support you in your everyday life in your everyday being hmm. well there's my family and there's music and that's that that's pretty much it you know i don't go out a lot i don't go out at all like i go out when i conduct a sh show in a in a theater on terrazia and that's like my my social life because this year is going to be all about this this opera that I'm writing and and there's a symphonic commission for Belgrade Bel the Belgrade Philharmonic also I have to finish it by first September so those are two big things mm -hmm. and uh, that's pretty much it I mean we say is there anything else but music I just, I follow M MMA re from recently <laughs> not too much though but yeah I have, I have I just realized like a few months ago, dude, you you know like 30 names of some guys like from like Walter Wade Division and stuff like that. And so I was like, yeah, that's that's interesting. So yeah, that, that's the only thing other than than you know music related stuff. Because usually, usually when I compose, I'm I'm in a studio when you know here's the piano, there is a computer. So when I do something, when I take a rest, I just take a guitar and I do something else. So it's it's a profession, it's a hobby, it's pretty much yeah it's, it's it's pretty much everything i do but it's in it, it's it's in different forms so you know after, after composing when i take the guitar to practice i feel like i'm com doing something completely, completely different, different even, yeah. even though it is it is also it is also the music mm. i wish i had more time to become a better cook though i mean <laughs> i love i love cooking in general and i wish i was a better cook so i, I hope that at some point i'm gonna give it more 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 time and more intention to details <laughs> as in music <laughs> and and that's uh that's another thing uh, you are constantly mention, mentioning attention to detail uh what does that look like for you which details are you paying attention to <laughs> details well you know if we're talking about music then it's it's i wish i was you know, detailed in the same way in every category of my life. I mean, as in music. <laughs> but yeah, I think the details are in general important, like details when you're trying to express something, details when you're trying to express yourself, the way of handling yourself, you know. I remember like students, like I, I'm teaching them how to write mails, like a decent mails, like you learn how to sign yourself, like those technicalities, those are little details that can leave a certain impression of you. And then again, it, it came from my composition professor that I mentioned, like he was about those, those technical details, but those were not just technical details, they actually say something about you, like how, how much time you put in. And they're the I'm elegance. Not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I know the right equation, but I hope you know what you mean. Like, mm. and in in music, it's also like that. Mm -hmm. Like every single articulation of every single instrument has to be right for everything to fit together perfectly. And of course, you know, sometimes. I mean, usually in rock and roll, people don't pay attention to those details. Like in most in most cases. Mm -hmm. But I mean, since I play those instruments, and you know, usually I record stuff myself and then when i'm explaining people how to play then it's an interesting process because you know a lot of times stuff that you do in studio you cannot really do live but you actually can so that's like my part of exploration mm -hmm. and then uh so just to kind of slowly start to wrapping up but i still have like a, a question in terms of of music and creating an expression um when do you know something is good enough? Uh, the day before the deadline. <laughs> uh, I love that's this answer. Have, that's when you have to do like the, the technical parts, like, you know, check if they can turn pages in correct places and that's it. Well, uh, it really depends, but the deadline is a, is a hell of a friend. 
yeah. for that question. I mean, because let's say my album, I should have released it like 10 years ago because like a lot of songs are actually recorded. Like the first song from the album is, is recorded in 2009, right? So, and I, I didn't have a deadline and that's what happened. I, like I, I put it out like 12 years ago. So yeah, deadlines are good. But in, when you don't have a deadline, when do you know it's good enough? Well, it's a question if you ever really know is it good enough, but I think it's just the amount of work that, the, that you put in and, and, and it, it kind of shapes itself in some, like, I, I think that for most parts, let's say my, my I did my symphony under a deadline, so it was like, but even in that, I, there are some technical things that I would maybe add up, but in terms of the form, everything is pretty much there, so... And of course, that, that that can sometimes be physically exhausting, like especially like this last period before actually you have to do the notes. Like that's when you're the most in and that's when, you know, those final decisions are being made. But do you really know when, when do you know? Is it good enough? Well, maybe you actually never know. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it can always be better. But uh, you also mentioned LA and I was wondering what happened for you there. I went there for, for master studies in composition at USC Thornton. It was a life-changing experience. I loved that period of my life. Uh, I went there. It was uh, the best way for me to realize the surroundings, like to, to see if I can fit in society, to see like whether what other people like that are doing the same thing as I do. And uh, but the thing about those sitting in two chairs, uh, on two chairs as I mentioned before, when I went to LA, I also had a job from Belgrade. I had to orchestrate Sanya Ilic. He's like a Serbian musician. Oh yeah, I love Sanya Ilic. Wow. And, and he did, uh, he did uh, music for some TV series, Stella, The Village is Burning and the Grandma is Fixing Her Hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I had to orchestrate that project and that's like an hour of music and that's, you know, it's it, it's a job that you really have to, you know, sit and do. And but there was no other way because actually I needed that money because I I was going to America and I need I needed for you know for technicalities for paying rent and stuff like that. So I had to take that job, and that took a lot of my time actually, where I could actually do something else, you know, to meet other people, to go to see concerts. I didn't see anything. Like when I was in LA, in LA, it was only like homework and then orchestration. Both years, like first first year, I orchestrated the whole thing. And actually I came to Belgrade to conduct it in Sava Center before the semester was over. So I actually had to like beg them to let me before and you know if I can do some arrangement for you. Oh yes, you can do an arrangement. And then I was doing doing the arrangement for these guys to let me go to Belgrade and then go then go to Belgrade to conduct it. But it was good actually because I was not hoping to go to Belgrade that soon because I left for LA in August, hoping that I'm gonna be in Belgrade next summer, not before that. And this concert was in November. So yeah. And I remember not telling every anyone. I, nobody knew I was coming. So I just Went to see my mother. I knocked on the door and she opened it. And I remember her face like, oh, like is it you? And later on, I thought, Jesus, I mean, she, <laughs> she, could a, she, she could have had a stroke. Like, maybe that yeah. was not such a good idea. But yeah. So, yeah, the thing about LA, th this was like the thing that actually took a lot of my time. And, but at the same time, if, if there, there wasn't for that job, I would be in a financial problem over there in Los Angeles. But despite all that, I met a lot of people. I made a lot of great friends. I played in a few bands. Those were, you know, not, not, it, those were just occasional gigs, but they were like good, interesting gigs. I played bass in one band and I played drums in the other band. I didn't play guitar in any of them. <laughs> they, 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 need, they didn't need the guitar and I just, you know, came in to help my friends. But actually, it, it went well because it gave me a routine that I didn't really have. Because when you, when you play an instrument only in studio, you you simply need that routine. You need to play a certain instrument with some with some band. You know, you simply need those gigs. So you don't need to like when I pick up the bass, 
I don't, I don't, I don't need to search for the tone anymore. It's there, like it's yeah. almost in a muscle memory, as 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 for drums as well. So it gave me that kind of routine. And professional wise, professional wise, uh, Donald Crockett was my composition teacher, and the the the, the most important thing that I, that that he actually taught me there. It was actually somehow optimizing the stuff that I already knew and was already using in a way. Like, you know, your conscience of ranges. Like, uh, ranges when you when you have certain material, like what's going to do if you put it octave higher, octave lower, like that sort of more technical and more like easy. I did it in my, in my other compositions, but I didn't put it in my brain like that. And, mm. and also the idea about time, because like I love Russian composers. I love Prokofiev a lot. So a lot of my music had had a downbeat. You, know, you always know where the downbeat is. And the thing that they taught me is that you don't really have, you don't need to know where the downbeat is. The music can go slowly, then go up, and then come back down. It doesn't have to be bomb, bomb, bomb. Stravinsky did it. So you know. Yeah. And again, I mean, I used to listen to Rite of Spring since I, since my first year of studying composition in Belgrade. But you know, I didn't really. I was not ready for it yet. Like to, to really internalize all that you know, those possibilities of making that, those rhythmical figures and that the way that music can simply flow without having a strict downbeat. Down, yeah. yeah. Then also jazz experience. There were a lot of great jazz professors, actually. That's, I, I went to LA to that particular school because of the guy named Vince Mendoza. He, he's, he's actually a jazz guy. He's a jazz arranger. He, he arranged the Donnie Mitchell's album, Both Sides Now. He arranged the uh, a lot of stuff, and he's a great arranger. He also studied composition with the Donald Crockett. Cro actually, the, my that, that's how I actually picked up Donald Crockett. I realized that this before maybe if this guy started with him, then that's the way to go. And it turned out that Don Crockett was actually the guy that taught me more than than Vince did, even though the Vince was the reason for me to go there. So okay, <laughs> Interesting. yeah, phenomenal environment. It's like you know that they had nonstop. Like, you know, master classes and stuff like that from the people from the industry, not professors. But, you know, you had Shaka Khan, you had David Foster, you had, I can't even, even remember the names. And in every category, you had the biggest possible names, like, you know, jazz composition, classical composition, jazz guitar. Pat Metheny was there. I was not there to see him then. But yeah. at some point, I, you know, I have time and I have to choose, like, what am I going to go now? You know, to see Shaka Khan. Yeah. So yeah, and I didn't see any concerts. That's actually one one thing that I pity the most. I lived like 50, 50 minutes from Staples Center, and like all the big concerts were usually there. Like, you know, I remember Stevie Wonder was in in in, in Staples Center, and I was like, oh, I have to do homework. You know, I'll see him next year. I'm gonna get back anyway. So I didn't see him. Bon Jovi as well, Coldplay, I mean, a lot of concerts. And no, I, I I had to do the homework. But yeah. It is what it is. <laughs> I'm I'm curious because I stayed a little bit. I, I'm like my personal interest or my personal love is always with traditional music, and you worked with Sanya Ilitz, and I'm wondering how do you see our traditional music, and because it has something very kind of special, and how much of that do you use in your composition as well? I use that. I used it the first time in, in 2012. Actually, that was the summer break between those two years in Los Angeles. And it was like a commission I did for my friend Nemanja Radulovic. He was on an Australian tour, and I had to do some composition that has some traditional melodic motives from Serbia. And uh, that's when I wrote Serbia and Fantasy. I later, when I got back back from LA, I uh, organized a concert on Kolaris and I conducted it with uh, Edvin Lukasesek. There's a great recording, and he, he plays it amazingly well. So yeah, from then on. Actually, in next few compositions as well, I use some material, and the, the the whole idea of actually bringing that material in this realm of classical compositions when you write stuff that are supposed to be like classic, modern, or anything. This is something like you know national schools, like something that Tchaikovsky did a few hundred years ago, right? But you know, it may, maybe language is is a bit is a bit more modern, it's a bit different, but. I said Tchaikovsky because I when I when I use that material I try not to spoil it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there there are some examples where 
contemporary composers take some traditional themes and you cannot you you can you cannot hear it. There is no theme. I mean only he knows what did he do with it to make it sound like like that's not what it is. So I, I tried to keep that you know that important element always there. And I did it a few times. Like there's a Serbian fantasy which has a lot of a lot of traditional songs in it. Then in the uh, the daughter of the moon for for cello symphony orchestra and narrator there is this one part where uh, you can hear the song called Preletesh of Tice Lastovic, wonderful oh, song. That's my favorite. Oh. And that uh, I, I, I harmonize it a bit differently. And you know, it's, it's a scene where actually that daughter of the moon, he, she, she sees the, the, the pasture, how is that pasture? Uh, yeah. uh, no, I cannot remember Shepherd, that. Shepherd. Shepherd, yes, yes. Shepherd, yeah. She sees a shepherd playing, a, laying on the grass and playing a flute and there's that song. So it's like, very like, yeah. Tremolo strings and you just, you can just hear that melody and it's it's like that, you know, it's, it's I, I just uh, changed the way the, the thing is harmonized. Hmm. And yeah, I think it's, uh, not ne not necessarily every composition needs to have that, but in general, I think that that composers should use it maybe a bit, 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 bit more because there is no really that 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 kind of arrangement for this traditional music. And traditional music here, actually, when people hear that kind of material, it's almost like they're not really comfortable with it. They, they think it belongs somewhere else. They think it, it belongs on, you know, some weddings under some tent or whatever. <laughs> yes. But you know, the, there's yeah, but there's a there's a lot to it, and I yeah. think that there's a lot of really good material that can be really greatly presented in this in this orchestral or, or let's say this classical suit. So yeah. I'm, I'm try. I try not to make it a mannerism because that's also like dangerous. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm gonna be the full composer. No, I don't want to be that. And actually, the thing that is that there is one movement from uh, this saxophone concerto that has Leona's theme. Third movement is I didn't have. I actually had two days to write it, so I was like, okay, you don't have time. It has to be like something that is, you know, effective yeah. and you know, with not not too much philosophy. But then you know, even that. That first part is Roma from Later on, there's some um, some faster part with uneven rhythm. Mm -hmm. Like it, 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 you know, it kind of breaks this room, and then it got back to it. So, so even though it is at the edge, on the edge, where the edge, on the edge, it's. I think it's. Mm, it's it, it's on a good edge. It's still kind of this middle part justifies this first part, and I don't know. I mean, whenever I try this stuff, I just try to make it, you know, formally well, like not to be boring, not to be predictable, to have enough surprises, and you know, to keep that that, that that's also a traditional thing. Like when I sing it, it has that. Yes, that something. It's it's a bit nasty. It's a bit, you know. I'm not sure if I'm smiling or is or, or, or is my smile a bit bitter. But still, I mean, that material has something that can be worked into something else. So yeah, you know. in a way, the way I see it, it's it's part of painting the soul with the music, painting the souls of of the people, <laughs> and not necessarily all the time. But that is kind of an important part of who we are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that, that that's something that has been here, like that way of articulating things. And actually, my awareness began when I was in LA because when I went to LA, I expected that you know, Guns and Roses are waiting for me and stuff like that. I mean, but then I realized the people that I'm hanging out with, they are listening to S. Marejepo, like some recordings from '60s. They are listening to some Balkan music. And they're like, oh man, this is good. So actually, they were the ones who opened my eyes to that material that was kind of lame because it's you know it, it turned into turbo folk and nobody likes turbo yeah. folk you know that mainstream way of handling that material can be sometimes even a bit vulgar and yes. simply bad but when you take a look at the older stuff i mean when you dig under that yes. you realize that i mean those players that play those things i mean those are it's not just uh, being a virtuoso but it's a being a virtuoso that is specific to certain 
certain region. Like, yes. you know, like yeah. when you go to Argentina, the way they play that bandoneons and stuff like that. I mean, it's almost like a national culture. You have also that in Serbia. Even though if you want to learn accordion, you, you have to go to Kragujevac, well, not Beograd. I mean, but this is, yeah. this, these are other problems. But I mean, there are a lot of interesting articulations. And, you know, if you, if, if you spend a lifetime learning how to play Bach and learning how to, how to like, ornament the right way, whether you're playing Baroque or anything else, I mean, why not this? Actually, I did a, an album with Nemanja Radulovic that's going to come out this this September for for Warner Bros. This is his first city for Warner Bros. And actually, we did some transcribing of Šišić, the violin player, Alexander Šišić. Šišić. Mm-hmm. There was a... There was a commercial on TV Palma, maybe you remember. <laughs> oh, Palma, Zivili! Yeah. It's incredible, like, Polo. I don't know, how, how would you... Actually, I don't even know the translation for Kolo, uh, but I can explain it by people holding hands and dancing together. <laughs> yeah, in circles, yes. So yes. I, I, I called it a circle dance because, I mean, yeah. on uh, when I was in L.A. Uh, what, what was the word? A chain of people dancing. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that can be different. You know, I, I, I put it in a little bracket, like Kolo and then a bracket, round dance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's understandable enough. But I forgot where was I. Anyway, that, uh, well, we did the transcription of that uh, Trishic violin, violin player that I was telling you about. It's like a very fast, very virtuosic violin style. And we took like three compositions and make it into one, made it into one. And luckily on YouTube, there's an option you can, you can play something half speed. So you can really hear in detail what he's doing. That's incredible how articulate that is. I mean, that's like, you know, it's quantized. Like, you know, you have five little notes here before he is the right one. And it's very uh, notating friendly. So we notated it all. And uh, with that attention to detail, actually, I'm trying to to, to write stuff for the orchestra. Uh, also in um, Daughter of the Moon, this composition of mine for cello and narrator and symphony orchestra, there's a part... Where they, where they play Morales. Morales is probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular round dance, you know, people holding hands, dancing, dancing in circle dance. <laughs> and I wrote those trailers down and it sounds pretty good. And, you know, they're not used to it. But then again, if you if you pay attention to, to how the real guys play that stuff, and if you just note it, right, then these guys can play it too. And that's like the, yeah. the beauty of going into that that type of detail and it's, it's it's just lovely i mean because there's so many different ways you can you, you can do a trailer like with that kind of stuff and i also play them on a guitar so i and I, I simply love discovering all those little patterns that yeah that one, once they get in your system you can just fire them up whenever you need them you know so it's so yeah i think that our traditional music has a lot to offer both in the, in this melodic way where phrases are not predictable they're not between two bars and four bars, it's you have Sevda Linky, like you no know, melodies on a very long breath, but yes. with a great melodical line, and you can harmonize it too, you know, in so many different ways. I mean, here I'm actually singing with a Bulgarian uh, singing group, and they, I mean, they are insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. they are like the rhythms, like they have songs in in uneven rhythms that have more than three rhythms within one song. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, changing yeah. Changing with it. I mean, it's just insane, but it's beautiful and it's really beautiful to see. And then when they jazzify that, it's even even crazier. So I just love that. So just to oh, be conscious yeah, of your time, uh, to have the final two rapid fire questions. Um, the first one is uh, what are some compliments that you like to receive? It's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That one is, you know, good enough. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess, I guess, I guess that I, I, I'm very clumsy with the compliments. Like when somebody gives me a compliment, it's like I'm, like I'm almost ashamed of it in a way. I'm still actually trying to build some dignity. Like when somebody says something nice, like that. <laughs> okay. Bang my head and say thank you. But, you know, it's I'm always uh, like you know embarrassed in a, in a way. So yeah, I, I, I don't know about uh, about compliments, but yeah, any compliment will do if it's. If it's from the heart. From the heart, okay. <laughs> and then the next one is, what is an absurd thing about you that not many people know about? Absurd. 
that not many people know about. Hmm. I have no idea. I'm sorry. It's fine. I should have I should have thought of something, but you know, yeah. No, no, I mean first it's... time searching for something absurd. Nothing is really too absurd, and then what people don't know, people know nothing anyway, except these few friends of mine. So so it's a it's a, it's a tough one. Do you have some funny rituals or something? Hmm. No, I should. I should I should I should try to make a schedule like I'm planning it for no, years. You shouldn't now. do anything. I think what you're doing is already incredible. So I don't think there are shoulds in your system. They're I, only coming from your head, honestly. <laughs> I know, but there should be some shoulds because if you have some routine, then maybe you can do more than what you have done. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there are certain little goals, big goals, and this is just like a mess and you're crawling to somewhere and then you get place. <laughs> without you know having this picture about it but yeah <laughs> okay uh and one last question is what are things that have become more important to you and what have become maybe less important to you with age with age with age you get certain integrity for what you do because you you know the more you do it the better you do it mm -hmm. so that integrity part is can pretty much be an umbrella term like for you know choosing choosing the right projects learning when to say no learning how to communicate in terms of whether it's something that is personal emotional or, or is it just you know talking about you know how much money are you going to get for the project because for some reason in serbia especially you know people don't like to 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 to, to talk about certain stuff and then you have certain expectations and those ex expectations are not met. So in that, like to be, to be concrete, to, to, you know, be respectful for other people that, that don't think the same as you. And I guess that's it. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I sit in awe in front of you. <laughs> so I sit in awe, so, so, um, uh, I don't even know the Serbian word now, but almost like with admiration. Uh, like <laughs> I, I was already kind of knowing that this, this will be impressive, but I, I, I did not expect this level of impressive. So I really want to thank you for everything you have done. It's, it's quite incredible. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I'm, as I said, like my English is some, sometimes it's okay, but sometimes it gets terrible. Like when my brain starts bugging and then I'm like, Ugh. I hope there's not too many of that. But yeah, th th thank you for inviting me. And I hope everything made some sense because I have a feeling that I, you know, I stop, start with one subject and I, then I go somewhere else. And, but that's you know... actually the beauty. I mean, actually, <laughs> the idea, the idea of this interviews is actually showing the person as it is, and it's it's the way you think. And I think it's a beautiful way to think because it's this divergent brain that is going all over the place and still is able to bring a little bit of focus to produce something, which is incredible. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. Mm, please, thank you for inviting me. You have just heard the story of Alexander Sedler, a Serbian composer, conductor, multi-instrumentalist, musical producer and associate professor at the Faculty of Arts in East Serbia. He completed his master studies in composition at USC Thornton School of Music in Los Angeles and doctoral studies at the Faculty of Music in Belgrade. He has performed with many well-known symphonic orchestras around the world and collaborated with some renowned soloists such as Nemanja Radulovic, Kamil Thomas, Drako Cholic and others. He has composed and orchestrated several musical pieces with the Moonlight Dog touching the hearts of many. Thank you for joining us on this journey and I hope you will like and subscribe so that our voices can touch more people.